Friday afternoon, and I prayed with him, and he was coherent going in and out, of course, and uh, he couldn't speak, so I, I asked if he wanted a tablet or a pen, and he said yes, or he nodded yes. I went and got him one, and he printed out that he was so happy to see God's people praying and doing the works of the Lord, and he really appreciated what we've done for him already and, 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 and praying and, and support. And I thought that was a real blessing and a privilege because uh, early morning Saturday, uh, he, he went home with the Lord. And I just wanted to mention that to you. And uh, I, I just thank the Lord that I was able to uh, talk to him one more time, pray with him one more time. It was really a, pr a privilege and a blessing for me. So God bless everyone, and thank you for listening. not on oh there we go i'm on now I can hear my own voice um before i start i just want to say something quickly about brad i got to meet brad maybe twice um and one time i was at the hospital a couple of weeks ago and i got to sit with him and he shared his testimony uh, peyton recorded it and it was truly a privilege it'll, it'll always stay with me it'll be a memory i will always have to be able to sit there and listen to this guy Tell me about his life and how God had truly changed it. It was a testimony um, like not many, um, not many will have a testimony as strong uh, as Brad did. And um, it, yeah, it was a real privilege. And um, I, I sat with him and I said, I said to him something kind of odd. I said, in some way, I'm kind of jealous of you. I said, because you get to go home and be with the Lord before I do. And he smiled and he said, yeah, but I just wish I could have done a little bit more. And, um, but I told him, you, you don't know what your life is going to, the effect your life will have, even once you've, once you've gone home. Um, so that was, that was awesome. So today, I'm going to talk about the Bible and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what we do in church. Okay, so we are in Romans 9. Uh, I will be speaking um, from 25 to 29. So... Let's start. As indeed he says, Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of, of sorry, of no, Sorry, I'll start again. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the seas, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would not have been like Sodom. We, sorry, we'd, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So, We've got three people talking in this, but Paul is the author of the book, and he is quoting a couple of people. Now, he's quoting the prophets, and the prophecies of the Old Testament are truly unbelievable. The prophets were literally the mouthpiece of God. Also, you've got to get your head around that. That's a bit of a, a thing to think about. They predicted with unnerving accuracy what would happen in the future, but more importantly, they predicted the life of Jesus hundreds, hundreds of years, even before he was born. Now, in the passage before this, Paul, the author of the book, has been explaining God's promises and, prov and proved his divine, I know I so struggle with this word, sovereignty. Do you guys get that? Sovereignty is a sad word to say. In these passages, Paul is showing us that the Jews didn't listen to the prophets, and he quotes Isaiah Sorry, of course, Isaiah and Hosea to show that it was foretold that only some of Israel would be saved. Now, Paul suffered from great anguish because, the Jewish, because of his Jewish kinsmen would be unsaved. He even goes as far to say that he would go to hell so that they could be saved. He would take their punishment. 
He says that. Now, can you say that about your friends and family, that you would go and suffer in hell so that your friends and family could be saved? When it really comes to it, although it's my mother's birthday today and she's actually probably watching, so hello, mom. I, I wish I could say that I would do that, that I would take their place, but I don't know if I would. I don't know truly if, when it came to that point. I was like, hell, all my family. I, I, I can't say. I, I might wuss out. But, but Paul knew that it would achieve nothing because he knows that none but Jesus could be any person's substitute to bear the wrath of God. We could not do it. We do not have that strength within us. Only Jesus had that strength. So you're in the passage, you're showing that the Jewish people of the time, it was written in the Old Testament that Jews wouldn't always be God's chosen people. He says, those who are not my people, I call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. Now, first things first, remember I said that, you know, the prophets were the mouthpiece of God. Well, in this passage, Paul is quoting, quoting Hosea, but Hosea is quoting God. So there's kind of like this three thing going on here. So it's not Paul talking, it's not Hosea talking, this is God talking. So when he says, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not beloved, I will call beloved, that is God speaking. And he's speaking to the Jewish nation. So it's God talking, but who is he talking about? When he says, those who are not my people, who is he talking about? Anybody know? The Gentiles. Okay, well done. Five stars over that. But who are the Gentiles? We are. That's us. So if you are not Jewish, then you're a Gentile. Now, <laughs> but why does God refer to the Gentiles as not his people? It's kind of obvious, but it's because... Those who are not the, you know, Jesus, uh, sorry, the, those who were, um, because if you were not known as a Jew back then, you weren't seen as God's people, known as a Jew. If you weren't a Jew, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. So I know this may seem like simple stuff, but it's important that we've got this clear in our heads before we go any further. So there's the Gentiles who weren't God's chosen people, and then there's the Jews who were God's people. Where are the Gentiles? Well, I don't know. There might be some Jewish people in here. So, hello if you are. Hey, he is the ball guy in the back. Um, <laughs> so, what does this passage tell us about how God feels about us? It said, so let's look at the passage again. It says, In the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. So he's talking about us there. He's talking about the Gentiles. So he thinks of us as sons, as daughters, as his children. And he calls us his beloved. Now, I love that word. I think that's a really nice word. It's one of those words that hasn't seemed over time seem to have lost that meaning. Like some words like love have lost their meaning because they're used so often. But beloved still has that weight. And that's how he talks about us. Now, one of the psalmists puts it like this, and I really like it. He says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. Now, let's have a little bit of an exercise. Try to think of a number that represents how much God loves you. Can you think of one? Nope, because you can't. Hey, I got you out there. You, some people are trying to think of a number, and then I yeah, caught you out. Um, does anybody know? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sing it. How deep the Father's love for us, so vast beyond all measure. Do you guys know that song? Think about that words, though. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but think about that. You know, how vast beyond all measure. That's flipping brilliant. I love that. But can you, like, think about it? And, and I, if you want to personalize it a little bit more, go say, How deep the Father's love for me. Let's all sing it together. How deep the Father's love for me. Me. How vast beyond all measure. Think about that. He's talking about you. He's, and the, the song says us because we're singing as a, as a group. But if you really think about it as your personal experience with God. That's how he thinks about you. 
is how vast, beyond all measure. I love that. But is this a love we deserve? Now, we'll go a little bit further on. It says, Isaiah cried out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel may be as the sand of the sea. Only a remnant of them will be saved. Only a remnant, a small amount. For the Lord will carry out a sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, the Lord of the hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. No. So here Paul is quoting the prophet. He isn't, this isn't actual God speaking. This is, he's quoting now Isaiah. I know it's getting a bit complicated with who's speaking when and why, so I'm trying to be a bit clear about it. So Isaiah here is saying that God has told him that although there were a lot of Jewish people, not all of them will be saved. You know, and for the Jewish people, that must have been a difficult thing to hear because they thought they were God's chosen people. But he says, if it not for his offspring. I wonder who he's talking about. What do you think the sentence will be? Because he says, the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Paul quotes Isaiah saying that God's sons, sorry, God's son will end if we are not, if it were not for, sorry, sorry, I'm getting myself all mixed up here. If it were not for God's son, we'll end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, do you guys know what Sodom and Gomorrah were like? Was it a nice place? It was bad, bad place, bad place. Now, there's a place in Swansea. Now, my friend Ben here, he's from, he's from England, but he's half Welsh, so he's okay. Say hello, Ben. <laughs> He will have been to a place in Swansea, which is the city nearest me in Wales, which some people quite often say there's an area in the city is like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's an area in, wine, it's called Wine Street. Now it's just full of pubs and bars and clubs and fish and chip shops. And it's just, it's, it's a nice place in the day, but you go there at night, especially by about 12 o'clock, and it is messed up. The people just drunk out of their heads everywhere you'll see. The people be down like alleyways having sex. They'll, you even go to the nightclubs. And, am I allowed to say sex in church? Anyway, I just did. Anyway, um, you go into the nightclubs and there'll be people in the corner of the nightclubs like going out there. It's, it's not pleasant. Uh, me and Ben have been out for nights out there and we know what it's like. It is like Sodom and Gomorrah. So I have that picture in my head of what Sodom and Gomorrah would have been like. I know it probably would have been a little bit worse, but... It's pretty nasty. So here Isaiah is saying that man is like Sodom and we will end up like Gomorrah. So what is he saying about the Jews, God's chosen people? What do they deserve? So what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Anybody? For top marks in the class, what happened to them? Destroyed. So Paul is telling the Jewish people that without God's Son, they deserve destruction. It's the same for us. We all deserve destruction. But God shows up and gives us grace. Because as we talked about earlier, His love is vast and beyond all measure. But to avoid destruction, all we need to do if you are not here and you do not know the grace of God, all you need to do is accept Jesus. It's that simple. Just say, Jesus, I follow you now. That, that's it. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. Now, you may think that that seems like a, a very um, abstract concept. Like, how do I actually do that? How does that actually affect my everyday life? Now, I read this the other day and it's kind of, I don't know who the author is, but I'm going to read it out. And it's just someone talking about what their life has been like since they became a Christian. They started following Jesus. I'm learning not to fear rejection, to stop withholding myself from those around me because I already have the acceptance and love of my maker, my savior, my God. His love is not held ransom by my performance as a human. His love is perfect. So I don't have to be. I really love that. I just thought that encapsulated it beautifully. Now I'll finish on this. 
Um, I, saw, I actually saw this quote <laughs> in a movie the other day. It was um, with Denzel Washington. It's a well good one. He's like Batman in it, so it's awesome. So go and check that out. But Mark Twain once wrote, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. I pray and I hope today you find out why. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome my uh, good friend Dan Torres. You, you need to take that. Do you want to wear the, the Britney Spears headset thing? Yes, please. Okay. All right, so. It's fun. It makes you feel like you're really important. This is great. You guys are going to see a lot of Apple products up here. It's a mark of a good Christian. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Wow, I can hear myself. Check that out. All right, you guys. So um, I'm going to be breaking a lot of rules today, but it's great because I'm speaking about breaking rules. So, um, For one thing, I'm not actually going to be starting off in the text I'm teaching from today. And the passage I'm reading is a little bit longer. So, uh, hey, I survived last time when I went over. Let's see if Chris invites me back up again. Okay, so I'm actually going to be starting off in Philippians chapter 3. Why? Because I think this really is a perfect encapsulation of the message I'm going to be delivering today. Uh, it really just expounds the three verses that I'm going to be discussing um, here in the text. Um, now, in Philippians chapter 3, I'm only going to be reading about nine verses here. If only nine. Um, we're just reading them and then we're going to move forward, Okay. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say that you need to be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. Now, you guys remember, circumcision is that sign that you belong to God. Um, that you have been set apart and are his people. Who, uh, who are really marked as his people? He's saying, those of us who worship the, by the Spirit of God. And we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees, who demand the strictest obedience of the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law, pretty much without fault. I added a little pretty much there, because <laughs> uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But I once thought these things were valuable. He once thought that following all these rules, that, that, that being a perfect member of this religion was valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I disregard everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Has anyone here ever been shopping for religions? Uh, there's probably a lot of people here that were either born into the church or maybe this is the first faith you had. But uh, am I alone here? Has anybody else like, looked around for religions? Okay, i got a few people here. Um, one of the things that you ask yourself when you're looking at the, the Buddhists and, and the Sikhs and the Wiccans and the, whatever else is out there, you think to yourself, okay, so what about this devout Buddhist or, or the really devout Muslim or the Sikh? Is God really going to reject their worship, this sincere um, very, you know, very intricate, very beautiful worship that they do, that all this effort and, and work that they put into this, is God going to reject that? And then is Christianity really any different 
from any of these. Well, I'm going to um, come back to, uh, to eighth grade here and say Webster defines uh, religion as an organized system of beliefs, ceremonies, and rules used to worship a god or a group of gods. In other words, religion is man trying his hardest and behaving his mess. Behaving his, yeah, behaving his mess, really. Uh, but he's behaving... <laughs> oh, guilty. Um, but behaving his best to meet that need that we have in our hearts, that God-shaped hole, that void that tells us that there's got to be more than this. That if I can be good enough, smart enough, and really impress God, then I'll finally arrive. But with Christianity, if you guys know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, oh, I'm going to get it started for you. I want to see, like, to see if people were going to start quoting it there. Uh, for it is by grace you have been saved. And this, not of yourselves, it is a free gift so that no one can boast. It would seem like with Christianity, it's Jesus plus Nothing equals everything. This is very different. Um, as, as some of you guys know, I recently got engaged. There again. Woo! Yeah. yeah, she said no. I'm just joking. No, she said yes. Um, but uh, I've, I've, I've started watching wedding shows here and trying to pick up ideas and whatnot. Um, there was this one where uh, the, the wedding coordinator, uh, it wasn't say yes to the dress, but something like that, and he's trying to get these girls and, and make over their whole wedding, and they'll have this tacky dress that they probably found on eBay, never got sized, and is made from God knows what material, and, and he, he'll go and he'll get like Kathy Ireland or some professional designer and say, look, I'm going to give you this free dress to wear at this extravagant wedding we're making for you, and, 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 and half the time they'll be like, Mm, no, I like this one, you know, it's got the ruffles like this. I'd be like, no, honey, I got you the best one over here. And they just go off together. It's, it's really funny. But anyway, you, you see that they're being given freely this appropriate, perfect dress. And yet what they want to do is present this tacky, torn apart thing that they kind of, you know, probably found it, you know, the dumpster of a thrift store. I'm sorry, that's, that's harsh, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully none of you guys are watching. <laughs> We're gonna, I, I digress. We're going to jump over into our passage now. Now, I'm reading Romans chapter 9. I'm going to continue here in verse 30, which is on the next page. There we go. In verse 30, it says, What does all this mean? What, is, what does all what mean? Everything we've been talking about these last several weeks as we've been going through Romans and talking about Israel and their unbelief and how God's dealing with them and, you know, uh, basically the last several chapters. What does all of this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God, the Gentiles being us, the non-Jews, and it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law. Instead of trusting in him, they stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I'm placing a stone in Jerusalem. That makes people stumble. A rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Looking at this here, one of the things that stands out is God will even reject the most devout worshipers of the religion that he prescribed, the Jews, who didn't accept the free gift of salvation by faith. See, Jesus thought that he is the way, the truth, the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through him. Jesus taught that he would pay the price to purchase us from bondage and just flat out give us this forgiveness and heaven and peace and everything that comes with salvation and a relationship with God for free. 
And all you have to do is receive this gift by faith. So now the big question, how is this faith any different from religion? I'm sorry I do this so much, but I want to start at the beginning again. So coming back to the beginning, God creates everything and he gives man everything. A growing, changing world full of beauty, a hot wife, and he says go forth and multiply. I don't need to expound on that. Uh, Barry's not up here, so you're not going to hear too much about this. <laughs> Just joking. Where is that fool? I love okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, God from the beginning gave man just one rule. It was pretty much like, don't eat mangoes, they'll kill you. You know, like, just don't eat this, you're going to die. But what he's doing is he's giving man the gift of choice. See, the tree of knowledge of good and evil offers you the ability to choose innocence and freedom, a relationship with your creator who loves you, wherein you can literally do nothing wrong because you have an eternity of paradise and infinite growth with infinite changes and infinite things that are interesting. And you can choose this life everlasting and that in abundance. Or you can choose what's behind this curtain. Hey, I love this. I had a curtain for my... Okay, sorry. But you can choose what's behind this curtain where you'll be held responsible for everything you do wrong because now you know better. And you'll carry this responsibility on your shoulders until you die on a dying planet. What's it going to be? So we look back and we think, Adam... What were you thinking? Don't you know the freedom, the peace, the joy, the amazing life that you could have had? And instead, you take responsibility for right and wrong yourself, as if you could even do a good job at that, and you would trade an incredible personal relationship with God himself for that responsibility. Again, Adam, what were you thinking? And yet, as you're sitting there, Ask yourself, what was I thinking? What were you thinking? Because all of us here have the tendency to do the same thing. See, from the beginning, we've been choosing to muster up some semblance of our own righteousness rather than to choose the free gift of life and a relationship with our Creator. See, even with Eve at the very beginning, in the garden, began making up rules to help her obey God. And she said that God restricted them from even going near the fruit. You know, God never said that. She made up her own rule and then said it was from God. What does that sound like? It's religion. God gave mankind one instruction. And we immediately began adding rules to it, thinking that by adding more rules, it's going to help us obey God. It's going to keep us from disobeying if we add more rules. How did that work for her? Did it work out? No, no, it didn't. No. See, all throughout history, we've been repeating this failing idea that by adding more rules, it makes it easier to follow God. Story time. Um, When I used to work in hotels, uh, we had this big Rosh Hashanah. Did I say that right? Rosh Hashanah. uh, Banquet for several days. And on one of those days, um, there was this uh, little Jewish boy who... Um, comes into the uh, elevator I'm in, and he's you know, standing right there next to the buttons, and he looks back to me, and he says, uh, could you push the button for number 11? And I'm sitting back here thinking, oh boy, you could push that button yourself. Like, okay. You know. And I'm, I'm sitting there going up, like thinking, what is... So, do you guys know what that's about? For, for those of you that don't know, see... Um, What's going on here is there's a a Jewish law that's devolved to the point where they feel that even pushing a button constitutes working on the Sabbath. See, because Exodus 20.10 says, on the seventh day you shall not do any work. And what's ironic, though, let's go to the scripture, shall we? Actually, it says that in the same verse that not even the foreigner that's with you is supposed to be doing work with you. So even by having the goy, which is the, 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 non, the Gentile that's with them at the time, um, push the button, it's still breaking the same law he's trying to follow. So what do we have here? Once again, by adding rules, you still end up breaking them. And by the way, the Pharisees were huge on this specific rule. 
And Jesus used to really ruffle their panties every time he would just heal someone or perform some miracle on the Sabbath. And that, I love that. It just always tickled me. But I need you guys to buckle your seatbelt because before we cast our stones at the Pharisees, I need you to realize we're on the same train with them. You see, although our new life as Christians begins through grace alone, through faith alone, what I'm sad to say is I see far too often Christians adding rules to this relationship with God with the good intention of it keeping us from disobeying God. For example, you go to church on Saturday. Oh, because you work on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Hmm. Or do you pray and read your Bible daily? Oh, God's going to be really disappointed in you if you don't. Yeah. Or how many times do you say, Lord God, when you pray? Because I could probably double that. Lord God, I, I just, Lord God, I believe, Lord God, that you are going to listen, Lord God, to this. You know, like, I am going to be able to make God listen this time. Okay, so uh, maybe I didn't nail you with any of those. There's more. Don't worry. Um, you see, when you're trying your very hardest to you know, live up to this ridiculous amount of rules that you've given yourself, you may consciously or subconsciously begin to see how short you fall from this perfect standard that you've created. Well, maybe not that you've created, but that you've noticed. Now, it's at this point that maybe you begin grading on the curve. Hey, okay, I'm still doing better than that guy. I mean, he came up here without any shoes, and he mentions sex every time he preaches. I mean, just look at him. Seriously, just <laughs> eyes off of me over there. I'm just joking, man. Oh, man. Don't worry. I'm going to get mine. That's okay. <laughs> and then, in order to give my little fragile self-esteem a boost, I begin altering the rules that I'm breaking so that the, I make some special exceptions that, well, hey, would you look at that? They just so happen to fit the very circumstances of my actions. Well, I guess I'm in the clear. You see, I'm not actually cheating on my taxes. I'm standing by economic principles uh, and paying what I believe I owe, which just so happens to be nothing. Um, I'm not lusting after them in my heart. I'm just appreciating the beauty that God has created. Or it's okay for me not to forgive this person. They never asked for it. So there we are trapped in this vicious cycle of trying to create more rules and alter the ones that we're breaking until the day that we die. Or if somebody miraculously pulls us out of this cycle. Now on the other hand, for my fellow believers, when you're least expecting it, the enemy, the accuser, comes knocking on your heart. Hey, this is the enemy right now. There you go. I saw what you did last night. So, um, what's your excuse this time? Is this the righteous Daniel that's going to reach hearts for Jesus' name? You're just another sinner. You're never going to be good enough. What do I say to this? Well, if I say, no, I am good enough, I'll try harder. And I'm going to give myself even more rules. I'm going to build my bubble until nothing can reach me. Yes, nothing can reach me would be right if I do that. Including that hurting sinner who needs to hear about grace and forgiveness. That is going to just see another religious hypocrite. And decides they want nothing to do with this Jesus who can free them. No. No, when Satan tells me that I'm a wretched sinner, I say... No kidding. Have you even been watching? But hallelujah, I have a God in heaven who not only paid for my sin in full, but he is working in and through me and has promised with blood that he won't stop this work until I see him face to face in heaven. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay. That is faith. And this is why Jesus, like they say here, I place in by placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. Because Jesus is the rock of offense to the religious person. Because if what Jesus says is true, and all we have to do is by faith receive this gift, 
of eternal life and peace and a relationship with God, then all this religious sincerity, all the incense and the robes and the oh, you know, all of this is worthless. And it's devastating to someone who prides themselves in all of this effort that they devoted to their religion. But I have faith. And I pray that we all have this faith. That if we believe in this rock, if we stand unashamed to be called a sinner that was purchased by his blood, even in the face of the scoffers and the religious hypocrites telling me that I'm wrong, telling us that we're wrong. God himself has promised anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word to tell us that we can't do this on our own. Thank you so much for showing us that we're never going to be able to attain righteousness by working hard or being perfect people. It's never going to happen. I ask that as we go through this week and and on out of here, we be filled with that love, that appreciation, knowing this gift came freely. That you chose us not by our merit, but by your love. And that that be something that shine and that our lost friends and family will see and they will thirst and they will ask. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Stand for this last song. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the Maker of Heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the Maker of Heaven. Trusting that you may suck you.